Hi everyone, my name is Greg Ford and I'm the CEO of Talent Click. And this is about a 15 to 20 minute webinar introduction to the safety quotient. And we'll move through quite a few of these slides quickly. But because this is being recorded, you can pause any time to read some of the information on the slide. And of course, feel free to contact us afterwards if you have any further questions. So let's get started. We like to begin by showing some slides, and these are kind of humorous. We see some situations that no one wants in their workplace. There's a bomb in that, um, the front of that uh, loader, in case you can't see it. Uh, this is an innovative approach to getting a forklift up in the air to retrieve something. And uh, obviously, this industrious fellow found an innovative new mask for doing some welding. So they are funny, but it shouldn't be funny, should it? I mean, we're dealing with a very uh, serious subject, that being safety. Here are some more catastrophic incidents. You probably remember the cruise ship that um, ran aground off the coast of Italy last year, and obviously millions and millions of dollars in damage. Um, the commonality to a lot of these incidents is human error, and that's what we deal with. In this particular instance, allegedly the captain of the ship did not obey rules and went too close to the coast. Here's another one. You probably remember this from the summer of 2013. This was in northwestern Spain. The conductor was driving this commuter train uh, at approximately twice the speed limit and of course was talking on the phone at the same time and there was some horrific video that came out of this. Once again, the cause was human error. So we've shown you some big incidents, but most incidents are not catastrophic. However, they're still costly and time consuming. So we always ask people to think about what's the average cost of injury and incident within your organization, but also when we look at how time consuming things are, calculate the time that you spend on uh, incident reporting and you find that it really adds up. Here are some industry stats. Approximately 90% of incidents that take place are due to human error. I would ask you to think about what is it in your industry and in your particular company. It may not be this high, but if you fit into one of these categories, it's probably an alarming amount of incidents that are preventable. Injury costs equal approximately one dollar of each, uh, one quarter of each dollar of pre-tax corporate profits. This comes from Liberty Mutual and the total annual cost of workplace injuries is approximately 50 billion dollars a year. Again, that comes from Liberty Mutual. It's a staggering sum of money. Here's what I was talking about before with respect to the paperwork. Uh, we've had some people tell us that they have to fill out the same paperwork for every single incident, regardless of the severity of that incident. So in this case, we're hearing about eight hours and uh, that's just for one, or sorry, five hours just for one manager. And if we look at eight of those incidents, that's approximately 40 hours of paperwork, again, due to human error. So think about how much time you spend on some of these people issues and think about what you're doing with respect to human error. We like to communicate to people that behavior is an outcome. There are contributing factors that lead to behaviors. They can be external. When we look at the hierarchy of hazards, there are, of course, administrative controls such as policies, rules, monitoring, and so on. There's the engineering controls. There could be extraneous circumstances such as weather and how your coworkers are acting. So those are all external. But what about the internal factors? These could be temporary things such as stress or fatigue. Perhaps there was a death in the family and someone's grieving. Um, it could be a physical impairment. We've actually had people say that uh, they were acting unsafely due to uh, visual impairment or loss of fine motor skills or what have you. But it's the last one on the list that we deal with. That's the personality and attitude of the individual. It's a really important aspect of this entire safety picture that has been neglected to this point. Here's an exercise that I ask people to go through when we're speaking. I say, close your eyes and imagine your next incident that could take place in your workplace. Just think about how, where it will happen, how it will happen, and imagine who will cause it. Just think about that for a minute. If you could wave your magic wand and predict that incident. Now, when I'm speaking live, I ask people to raise their hand if certain faces came to mind, if they were able to envision certain people that seem to 
come to mind when they're thinking of this next incident that takes place? I'm wondering if that's what's happened to you. Why is it that certain people come to mind? Well, it's because people usually act in predictable ways. And that's what we're here to talk about is using predictable methods to predict incidents. Uh, the field of predictive analytics is indeed exploding. Here are two books that were on the bestseller lists uh, over the past couple of years. Now, if you haven't read either of these, you've probably seen this movie with Brad Pitt. It was called Moneyball, and that, of course, was about predictive analytics. So here's another exercise I'll walk you through. This is a calendar, an annual calendar. It happens to be from 1980. So let's circle a date on this calendar, August 8th, 1980. On that date, way back when, there was a major incident that took place. And it was a explosion at a refinery in New Jersey. There was $5 million damage to that plant and approximately $1.5 million in medical treatment for one person. Who was this person? Perhaps you've heard of him. His name is Charlie Moorcraft. Charlie's been on the speaking circuit for years and years and has written books. He's an electrifying speaker, very emotional when he tells his tale of how he caused that incident um, and the personal damage uh, physically and emotionally that came out of that. Severe burns to uh, quite a good portion of his body. But nonetheless, we, we looked at the causes, of course, and after the investigation was conducted, they concluded the operator, Charlie, did not follow proper procedures. He ignored the shutoff valves. He left a vehicle running nearby. And uh, when he was doused in, in uh, fuel from the refinery, the vehicle nearby actually ignited the fumes of the fuel. And of course, he caught on fire. The vehicle caught on fire and then the plant caught on fire. Um, he was not wearing his personal protective equipment. He did not have his safety glasses on, and he had the sleeves on his Nomex fire retardant um, overalls rolled up. So there was severe skin damage to his forearms. Now, here's how Charlie describes himself to us. He said, quote, all my life I was a rebel, a risk taker, a thrill seeker. He said... On the job itself, I was someone who took shortcuts. I would sit at the back of the mandatory safety meetings and roll my eyes behind the sunglasses I was wearing. And in fact, I would make fun of the others who actually followed the rules and always wore their PPE. So Charlie says his behavior was a result of who he was, of his default personality settings. And he was making bad choices all his life, not just on that particular August 8th date. So looking back, it was predictable that an incident at work was going to happen sooner or later. Let's go back to this calendar. We're going to press rewind. Here's the August 8th date, but there was usually, or there is usually a recurring pattern of unsafe accidents, uh, sorry, actions prior to any incident. So here's what they were for Charlie. And this is common to the pattern of events for most people. It's just nothing happened during all these events that I'm showing you right now. Nothing happened. But going back to the exercise where I asked you to close your eyes, this is how we are able to predict uh, who is going to be involved in incidents sooner or later. Um, we are able to identify the people for whom these actions are finally going to catch up with them. A lot of people think they can just interview or use their gut feeling and they'll just know who the best workers are going to be. They're going to know who the rebels and the mavericks are. Well, they're wrong. The research shows that people don't have that proper gut instinct and gut feel and they just can't identify the high risk workers all the time. Research shows that one out of four people have high risk tendencies. And we can't always spot who that person is. In this case, it's the little guy in the back. So this is where we come in with what we do at Talent Click. Now make no mistake, we're not saying that companies should abandon everything they've been doing. We're just here to complement what they're doing. Companies still need the right equipment, proper machinery, proper training, rules, procedures. Um, they need all of that. What we're saying is add another piece to the safety puzzle. Look at hiring the right people and putting them in the right jobs. We talk about fit a lot. Some people are a good fit with certain jobs, others are not. And then the last 
bullet point on there is number five, the training and coaching. And that's where we really can add some value in providing insight as to who these people are so that supervisors, coaches, managers, and even the worker himself uh, has that insight to who the person is and they can engage in some training and coaching for that person. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Here's a quote from the global head of health and safety for SNC-Lavalin. And um, we're finding that a lot of senior level safety leaders are starting to look at this last piece of the safety puzzle. Now, with respect to personality assessments, they've been around for years and years and years. Most people have heard of the Myers-Briggs assessment. Uh, it's only been recently, though, that organizations like ours are starting to apply this to the frontline safety sensitive environment and to um, some of these let's call them blue collar workers who are actually operating the equipment and in the um, the, the high risk situations uh, prior to this most personality assessments have been used for the uh, administrative corporate positions uh, for salespeople, identifying leaders, customer service, that kind of thing. So, so there's a real sea change in applying this in a new innovative way. And that's what we're doing, applying it to the frontline industrial setting. Here are some organizations that are using this. Uh, there's some multi-billion dollar multinational organizations you might recognize there. We're going to quickly cover some of the psychology and social science behind this. Again, we're moving quickly, so you will have to press pause and even rewind if you want to go through some of this in more depth. Um, personality is often not what people think it is. Personality doesn't really change. It is someone's default settings. It's, the, it's how we react when no one's watching. It's our knee-jerk impulses and urges and personality drives our behavior and it is resistant to change we'll talk more about that in a minute when i show this photo uh, people react in different ways some people uh, clutch their chest and uh, envision broken legs and a trip to the hospital whereas others look at this and immediately think wow that's that's cool i'd love to be that person there's no right or wrong answer to this, but how you just reacted to this is a function of your personality. Are you a risk taker? Are you impulsive or are you cautious? Here's another example. We all know what to do when we see this, but why is it that some people will stop, look both ways, count to three before proceeding, whereas others roll through that stop sign? The tool that we're talking about, the safety quotient assessment, is a quick online assessment. It's only about 15 minutes long and it's all automated. And when somebody presses submit or enter at the end, um, all the answers to the questions go through uh, what we call our black box of algorithms. And then we um, we output several reports and here's one of the reports and you can see the five dimensions that are included on this on the left there's rule resistance second one is anxiety the third one's irritability distractibility and impulsiveness and there are scores for each of these and obviously the higher the score the higher risk that individual is there is a safety quotient or sq score as well uh, which we can go into a bit later When someone scores high risk on, let's say, the first dimension, the rule resistance, uh, this is what can happen. Um, there's the example of Chernobyl, the costly, costliest accident in history. But typically people who are rule resistant defy authority and they often ignore the rules and procedures, whereas low scorers always take comfort in following those rules and guidelines. The second dimension that you saw was anxiety. So the opposite of that is someone who's calm and steady under pressure. So some people do panic or freeze in unpredictable situations, whereas others are quite calm. Irritability on the road, this translates into road rage. Some people, when they get cut off, on the road or in the workplace when they feel that someone's uh, slighted them the, they fly off the handle they lose their temper and have to lash out either physically or verbally with that other person and of course this is a major cause of, of uh, accidents and um, deaths on the road 
Distractibility, again, on the road, uh, this is a major one. Up to 80% of incidents behind the wheel are caused by a distracted driving. And this happens as well with other incidents. You saw me earlier show the Spanish train crash. Here's an incident that took place in California, one of the worst train crashes in history, but it was due to the conductor not paying attention. In this case, he was text messaging. The last one on the list is impulsiveness, and uh, this is the Exxon Valdez disaster. But impulsive people tend to be a little more reckless and prone to taking unnecessary risks, whereas the low scores tend to cautiously evaluate the options. There are some people in safety-sensitive situations who we want that are cautious, and um, that's, uh, that's the final dimension. Some of the research and case studies, again, I'm going to move quickly through some of these. The first one is um, 645 oil and gas construction workers. The research results showed that there was definitely a correlation between the personality assessments and the incident rates. Um, you can see that workers with high impulsive scores had an incident rate five times higher than those with low or average scores. And there are several other research conclusions on this slide as well. You can press pause if you want to read those. I'll show you another research study. This was from uh, Multi Industries. It involved oil and gas, paper products, construction materials, manufacturing. And the third bullet point down concludes that approximately 7% of the entire group accounted for almost one half of all the recordable injuries. That's staggering. That's an amazing statistic. And the last one shows that high risk individuals had recordable injury rates almost six times as high as the other 93% of the group. So what I'm showing you with these research studies is that this kind of tool absolutely works. It's scientifically proven to identify uh, some of these high-risk people. And there's a strong, strong correlation between the high-risk personalities and incidents in the workplace. Here's another one, linking uh, assessment scores with driving. Drivers with highly resistant scores had 130% higher at-fault accident rates, um, a much higher number of traffic tickets. Uh, drivers with highly irritable scores had a 158% higher at-fault accident rate and again a higher near-miss rate. The final one is uh, temp workers in auto manufacturing. Once again, conclusion is just hard to ignore. If this organization had screened out or eliminated the 9% of people who were identified as high risk during the hiring process and replaced those people with non-high risk employees, it would have saved 850 fewer lost days due to injury and $270,000 in direct costs. And then, of course, the indirect costs, which are hard to calculate, would have run into the millions. There are more research studies and uh, examples, but these are a few. And contact us if you'd like to talk further about these. So one of the questions we get asked a lot is, well, this all seems fine and well, but how do we apply the data? So there are different methods and recommendations that we would have for someone. The first one is staffing an organization and this could be the hiring of new workers or it could be the placement of existing people into the right position. Some people may be in positions um, for which they're unsuited. The second is training and coaching. The third is self-monitoring and the fourth is organizational risk analysis. Let's talk about each of these really quickly. The hiring, as I mentioned, is an easy one to address. Um, some organizations have a luxury of a large labor or talent pool, and they can use this as a screening tool. Um, having said that, please make no mistake, this shouldn't be used as a pass or fail. It's just another bit of data that should be used in the entire hiring process. I'll let you have a look at that and press pause if you need to. The second point that I mentioned was the coaching and training. This kind of tool and the report information that it includes is really useful for the supervisors, for the foremen, for the managers that are managing those frontline workers. And um, the report that we give actually provides tips and uh, recommendations for how one would supervise these people, how to talk to them, how to coach them, how to give them that self-awareness as to who they are. And it's just a, a really good additional tool for that um, coaching and training. 
There's another example of how do you talk to someone that scores high on distractibility. The third application for this is the self-coaching or self-monitoring. And um, meet Christian. He's actually one of our customers. And he said, I look at this tool as just another tool to give to my frontline employees. I already give them uh, safety glasses and vests and so on. Well, for the cost of a hard hat, I can give them this tool and have them work through their own report. Uh, it's the self coaching report it's we actually call it the safe self personal action plan and it's a workbook at the end of that report for the participant himself and it only takes about half an hour to 45 minutes for the person to work through that but we have heard words like epiphany it's really given these frontline people some great insight as to who they are and given them information they've never really learned before about themselves and that ties into behavioral change. People often ask us, can you change um, personalities? Well, no, uh, personality is resistant to change. And that's what you see in the left-hand column. But in the right-hand column, when you look at that uh, yellow inverted triangle, there's awareness, coaching, and training. It's the coaching that takes place from the supervisor or foreman or the self-awareness and self-coaching that takes place that can impact the individual and lead to behavioral change. Uh, an example I give is I know about myself that I'm highly distractible. And when I'm driving down the road, I'm often tempted to check uh, messages on my smartphone. Um, that impulse or urge will never go away. But knowing that about myself, I now take different um, steps and I put that phone in the glove compartment or in the back seat. That's the behavioral change that happens with people like me. There are dozens of other examples like that in the workplace. We can change. So you probably know someone who is a very excitable, outgoing person, and in the past they were not a good listener, but through training, coaching, um, maybe someone talked to them at some point, they've learned to be a better listener and just you know hold their tongue when others need to speak. Uh, or an irritable person. Uh, perhaps they've actually gone to anger management classes, uh, or if not, maybe they've just learned over time how to be less confrontational. So there are lots of examples. These are just a few, but rest assured that behaviors can change. Now with the self-coaching plan, this is part of the workbook. We're not going to go through this, but again, it's a snapshot from one of the, one of the pages of that. The fourth part of the slide that I showed you on how one can apply this is the organizational risk analysis. So this is of particular interest to high level business leaders the like the 30,000 foot view. So each of the diamonds on this uh, graph are particular scores for an individual. So there can be dozens or even hundreds of scores that we put on a scatter plot graph and start to show where the, the patterns and trends are for different areas. And we can look at where the high risk people and um, slice and dice the data. Are they in particular uh, teams or divisions or geographic areas? Uh, we can slice and dice according to job category, um, you know, seniority within the company, new people, old company, and, and so on. We can also benchmark against in industry averages, or um, I mentioned occupation already. So there's lots of different ways that this can be done. Getting to the summary, individual people make choices about safety. It always comes down to the person. We can do as much training as we want and impl implement procedures and rules and those are all necessary but at the end of the day it's people and their behaviors that drive safety outcomes. We're all different. There is no right or wrong personality. It's all about fit. So let's get to know each person and let each person better understand himself in order to predict choices, behaviors, and human error in the future. Thanks for your time and attention, and please contact us if you have other questions, and we look forward to helping you make the world a safer place.